Friends, good to be with you again. Uh, we're looking at uh, week three of our theology video series, and today we're asking the question, what is a person? Uh, <clears throat> there are different ways to uh, think about that. I wonder what would come to your mind if I asked you to, uh, to describe or to define a person. Uh, you would probably be reaching for different kinds of things. Um, and we do have different ways in our society and in our encounters day by day to assess or to understand a person that we, we meet. I mean, there's the scientific way of understanding what a person is, uh, looking at how we fall in the classification of living things uh, and looking at our development over the uh, millennia and so forth. Um, there are other ways, uh, politically, uh, we think of human beings as how they connect with the political process. Perhaps uh, someone looks at you and says, you're a vote, either for me or for my opponent. Um, it's a process uh, and perhaps a game in which we, we play a part. Uh, but it doesn't go uh, profoundly deep. Other ways, I mean, I, I, I won't um, spend a lot of time on this, but uh, what it means for economy. For You're, you're a, someone who will buy something. You're, you're, you're a part of a... Uh, an evaluation that we made at the end of every quarter, how was our economy working? Uh, were the consumers buying or not? Um, family and friends is another way to engage and to encounter and to feel, right, the presence of a person uh, and, and, and try to uh, relate to them. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the question of uh, the self and our introspection. Uh, who am I as a person? Okay, all of these are ways to think about um, what it is to be a person. All of them have, they begin with some kind of assumption and, um, and, and neither, I mean, we can say none of them is somehow absolute. Uh, and uh, and so, so our question becomes, you know, how, how do we think about that? We, we're, we're asking from the perspective of theology, from a Christian perspective, but also in the background is very much the question of, nursing and the professional connection that we have with all of the people, all of the persons that we, uh, we relate to. So I'm going to begin uh, with the, the theological and biblical understanding of what uh, a, a person is. Uh, and um, we, we start then uh, in Genesis 1, which is a great place uh, to start looking at something since it's the first book of the Bible. Genesis 1 describes the days of creation, the process of creation that uh, God takes the earth through. And on the sixth day, uh, when everything else is in place, uh, he finally dares to put the human being, uh, the human beings, uh, there uh, on, the, uh, on the planet uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and speaks to uh, who he understands them to be or what he understands them to be. So I'm going to read. Uh, from Genesis 1, uh, verses 26 through, uh, through uh, 28, and this is what it says. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Thus, uh, the passage in Genesis so, a couple of things about the language there. Uh, it's said quite often that God makes us in, our, in His image. And uh, right away, um, what we're seeing is both a similarity and a difference. He makes us in our image, but He doesn't create fresh gods uh, of His own kind. Uh, <clears throat> so, he, he does something in which we are like Him in some way. Uh, and we'll come to looking at what, what, that, what that could be. Secondly, though, the play with male and female is, is very interesting and quite profound. Uh, in the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. And then says to both, go, multiply, and subdue the earth. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about that in, uh, in theology, in commentaries. Uh, and, uh, you could always go to a library and, and look up a commentary on Genesis and sit down and see what something uh, says. But in the long run, I think what, what we are realizing is that uh, there's something about humanity as a whole that's made in the image of God, but also something specifically that is <clears throat> relates to each individual, whether male or female. It's been said that this is one of the most democratic verses in the Bible, in that there's an astonishing equality uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> we are, we have, men and women have equal dignity. They have equal place before God. We are equally uh, in the image of God. And so that's an important thing to uh, to point out. Now, as I talk, I hope that you uh, are looking at the outline that's provided with this video uh, so that you can see uh, where I'm going and, uh, and that there is uh, some kind of structure uh, to, to the things I'm saying. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, point 2B now, then. What is the image? When we, when we say the image, what, what does that imply? What is, you know, I'm, does it mean we're all created with white hair and, 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 and white beards and so forth, that we look like some picture of God out of Michelangelo? No, that's not what it means. Well, what does it mean? Uh, there are three kind of proposals that are batted around by, uh, by theologians, and I think all of them are worth thinking about. First of all, is the connection that comes out of the text. You know, what is the text saying? The text clearly says that we should have responsibility in the world that we live in, that we should uh, have stewardship. Uh, some of the older languages, we should rule, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we should definitely have that uh, authority. Uh, and so, in that sense, the image is what it takes to rule, what, you know, the capacities it takes to organize and, uh, and to get something going right. Nurses know about that, right? I mean, we all know about that. We all have a, a, a checkbook to balance. We all have we need to get out the door with everything we need uh, in the morning uh, and then uh, at work. Things need to happen in order that, uh, that the right things can occur. So uh, that uh, responsibility, that stewardship is clear. But secondly, there is that element of the, the gender relationships, which is also very poignant in the text. And uh, it's not just created male and female, but then um, to go and, uh, and create a fruitful a population for the earth. So, uh, so relationship is also there. And there are some uh, biblical writers that say this is the most important thing, is that we are created in relationship. And in that sense, we reflect the relationship that God cares to have with us. He is a relational God. He loves to relate. And so he creates us necessarily in relationship, not only male and female, but in all of the, of the relationships that we have in society. Uh, parents and friends and professional relationships and all of that. So, uh, so that's another element that's implied strongly by here, by the, what we see in this text. Thirdly, though, uh, and this is also, I think, uh, and it, this one is particularly poignant to this class, there's the spiritual or ethical capacity we are made to obey. How do we see that? Well, we don't see it really in chapter one because there's no disobedience, <laughs> but in chapter two, we have the disobedience of Adam and Eve and the great destruction that that results in lifestyle, in, in, uh, in the future, in, in the hope. So that too seems to be an element that's implied by this text. The ethical realities of life. We are, we are supposed to live up to what is true, what is right, what has integrity. And that also seems to be in the image of God because God is holy and he calls us also to be uh, to have integrity and to live up to that reality. Uh, so three elements. Uh, do we select, as point C, do we select one or do we see a complexity? Again, uh, we got scholars duking it out <laughs> and, uh, and uh, they, some insist, yes, one over the other. Uh, I go with the scholar, I respond to those scholars who say, the, the, the biblical text is a rich one, and it seems to mention, it seems to, to raise the issues of all those things. Human beings are complex, and it makes sense to me to, to see in some situations its relationship I should be dealing with. If I'm dealing with my wife, I need not to boss her, I need to come alongside her, and she needs to do the same with me. 
but uh, if I'm uh, at my uh, office, uh, I need to make sure things uh, are lined up uh, in the right way. I need to, uh, you know, evident, uh, make evident my ability to, uh, to organize. Uh, and in all of that, ethics, integrity is always uh, an important point. So um, I'm suggesting, this is the third, second point under C, each one may have a particular personal importance given context. Um, an older way this used to be seen um, is that men in society primarily have the area of, of responsibility and organization, and women have the primary aspect of relationship as we might see it versus the workplace versus the home. Uh, I, I'm glad to see that this is being, uh, we're moving ahead from that because I think all of those things have to happen in, in all kinds of places. I think personality has to do with that. Some uh, people are better at responsibilities. It's not always the guy that's going to balance the checkbook for the family by any means. Uh, in our family, my wife does it, and I'm glad she does. <laughs> she does a good job. Uh, she does it better than I. Um, so, And if we took, take a look at what happens in the nursing context, there's a particular poignancy here, there's a particular complexity uh, as uh, a nurse is involved in uh, a setup which has to be strong, uh, the responsibility has to be strong, and yet the nurse in some way is also called upon to ask how relationship is making a difference, how, how something is happening along that line. So. Um, uh, there's a flexibility there. Uh, the nurse is hopefully also always thinking about ethics. Uh, and I'm gonna, just to challenge us with that uh, flexibility at that point, uh, and, and how the, the scripture speaks of the, of, the, of the ways of the tasks we're called to as a person. Uh, <clears throat> but with the final proviso, going back to the language of the image of God, that in all of this, Scripture is really pushing us to understand all of those are expressions of God's care. The responsibility is an expression of God's care. Relationship is God's care. Ethics is, a, is, a, is, a, is an expression of how God wishes for human society uh, to be. And so there's always that in the background, in the complexity of who we are as persons. We never get away. This is the Christian perspective. This is the theological perspective. We never get away. Uh, from, um, <clears throat> from the fact that, uh, that God is behind it all and in it all and through it all. That's what it's supposed to be about. Human beings, uh, we can say, uh, are those people who are, or th those beings who are rich in potential uh, but limited in scope. Our potential is huge, uh, what might be done as the image of God um, we are uh, uh, we're able to, uh, to, to, to partner, we're able to get into situations and, 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 and places where amazing things can happen uh, uh, through us and, and, uh, and in us. Uh, but there's the need also to understand our limits and reliance on others. We are not gods, <laughs> right? We are in, a, a, in, in connection with people who together we are working on what, what needs to happen in this larger and, and, and very... Uh, complex and overwhelming society in which we're in. We can accomplish things as being in the image of God, but also <clears throat> the scope is limited. Uh, another way to say that is we're able to give much, but also we are needing from others precisely as much as we give. Human beings are those who are in the position to give and interact, but human, human beings are also in the exact position of needing, of requiring provision from all kinds of directions. And that's a point that I want to look at in a little more detail with point three. The third point uh, we want to look at is uh, humans and needfulness, uh, to what extent humans are, uh, are needful. Um, this comes uh, from a fairly recent pro uh, theological proposal by uh, the theologian Karl Barth, uh, and um, I'm interested in this because I'm, I'm doing some writing and research in, in, uh, uh, in this area, but I find it uh, uh, very, 
uh, poignant and also relevant to not only uh, my own understanding of, of who am I supposed to be, but I think it connects with, uh, uh, with, with nursing as well in a, in a deep way. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use the language fairly carefully, the distinction between needfulness and neediness. I think needful is that we, you know, we need food, we need air, we need each other, we need all kinds of things. Uh, and sometimes when that gets denied or problems arise, uh, then it becomes neediness uh, in a more pejorative way. I'm going to make that language uh, a little bit, that distinction, um, but uh, see what you think. All right, we begin again um, with Genesis 1 uh, and the sixth day of creation uh, and the realization that uh, God in providing the reality of creation and getting it actually to interact and function, uh, creation is actually working fully, completely, uh, without any assistance from the human couple. Uh, it's actually it's going fine. Uh, and, the, and the human couple then are, <clears throat> are uh, implanted in it. They arrive in it. Uh, and uh, and uh, the point that is made is that this shows uh, not that really that the human couple are sort of now the uh, crown of creation. Um, that's a phrase that's not in scripture, actually. Uh, that's something that comes out of the 19th century that we want to think of human beings as the best there is of creation. And uh, in a sense, perhaps uh, that's true. But what that story shows is that uh, human beings are the neediest of all creation, that they are not, they don't arrive until everything else is prepared. Uh, and, uh, and in that sense, uh, they need creation as it's given. And there's a, a very interesting basis for, I think, an ecological theology there. Uh, creation is, is, is a given to us, and so probably a bad thing if we go out and try to manipulate it or decide uh, you know, this huge valley can be reduced to a single crop and everything will be fine. <laughs> Maybe it won't be. Uh, or uh, other ways in which we uh, manipulate creation for a small temporary purpose uh, and, and find that we're running into problems. The neediness of human beings, though, goes beyond that, clearly, in the text. Uh, and, uh, and we would affirm that human beings in that sense are needy not only for all of creation as it is, but we, turns out we're needy for each other. We're placed in relationship to each other. The first thing that happens is we meet each other there in Genesis 1. Uh, human beings are needy for uh, other human beings. And in the context, uh, human beings are most needy, most profoundly needy for the needful of the relationship with, uh, with God. So human beings is created uh, in needfulness of creation, of each other, and of God. Uh, we can take an example from the good, uh, parable of the Good Samaritan that we have looked at once already. Uh, we want to look at it in a, in a different layer now uh, and ask uh, not just in terms of the covenant uh, realities that are, are happening and evident in that uh, passage, but what about the human uh, relationship? What is, uh, what is a human being as we, as we hear it described there? Again, the parable begins with Jesus being confronted in a small town here in Luke 10 um, by a self-important lawyer who says, well, if you're you know, such a great teacher, tell me what are the two greatest commandments in the Old Testament? And Jesus says, well, to love God and to love your neighbor. And the self-important lawyer then says, uh, who is my neighbor? And I, I think it's right that, that those who read that passage and say he's really asking how few people do I have to relate as my neighbor? How can, you know, what's the smallest amount I can get away with uh, in, in asking who my neighbor is? Jesus responds with the parable. It talks about someone traveling and he is, uh, he is set upon by thieves. He's a victim almost unto death lying in the gutter uh, and the Samaritan helps him. And Jesus asks who is his neighbor? who is his neighbor. Now look at what the parable has done. Jesus has taken the time to set a scene and he's taken the lawyer from being the self-important upstart in the village market. And he said, okay, now if you are in the gutter, if you are 
dead and dying, if you have nothing but need in your life, now who is your neighbor? Now who is your neighbor? And so Jesus is able to say, uh, okay, we're not talking about someone who has created a little persona for themselves, but just for a human being who is the neighbor. And the answer is anyone or the first person who comes by or the, the person who comes by uh, who can uh, respond to those needs in, a, in a, an important way. So uh, if all are needy, who is your neighbor? And uh, it points to the fact that Jesus is really willing to look at all of the people he connects with as those who are potentially the neediest of the needy. Uh, <clears throat> we've, uh, you know, the, the women who, the woman who comes to him with the flow of blood, he stops and takes care of it. Uh, uh, all of the questions that arise, he stops and he handles them um, seriously. And so, uh, yeah, there's a strong uh, sense there that Jesus is, is asking us uh, to understand our own uh, vulnerability together with everyone else's if we're asking the question, not only who is my neighbor, but what is a person? What is a person? Here's another example from, um, <clears throat> from the course of human life. Nurses usually have seen brand new babies being born. That is a human being, right? That uh, 10 second old child, uh, as soon as he's begun to gasp, even perhaps before, uh, that's a human being. And yet there is nothing, nothing else to de determine anything about that human being except need and potential. Need and potential. And insofar as the needs of that infant will be taken care of, the potential will come into, uh, into, into being. And what potential there is, is massive potential. But underneath, is it true, I'm asking, that that child, that young person, <clears throat> that adult, that old person will also always, always be uh, as needy in some sense uh, as, the, as with the uh, initial birth. All right. Uh, human beings as needy. It's an interesting way. I mean, it's a fascinating way to, uh, to understand. Uh, Karl Barth wants to take it in a, in a particular direction, though. Uh, he really wants to point out, because for us, when we talk about it, uh, need is, is a negative thing. You don't want to, you know, date someone who is needy. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps we get tired of those who uh, seem to, to be uh, so needy that they there's nothing we can do to help them. Bart would like to, us to understand again from Genesis 1 that needfulness is a profound blessing. To be able to have relationship means that you know, we, we need it. Uh, <clears throat> to be able to need God means that we will come to know and love God in the right circumstances. Uh, to be able to love and understand and need creation means occasionally we're going to get some very nice meals uh, and hopefully they will be nutritious as well. <laughs> so uh, think about this. Radical needfulness as blessed needfulness. That is the way to know. That is the way to love. And uh, as everything goes right, uh, it becomes a profound blessing. If there is provision of that needfulness, then there is no greater experience in the world, may I suggest. The problem comes um, in relation to uh, the idea of sin, as, uh, as it always does in the, in the Christian context. The problem comes because uh, we would understand human beings as ultimately the tendency toward self-centeredness means that I will really not want to hear all the time how much I owe God or how much how needy I am in relation to uh, everyone else. But I'll plan my own uh, provision. So I, and I'll tell you this, I know this, I know how to get out in the morning uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with the right clothes and the breakfast and coffee. Uh, I can handle my own needs in that sense. Uh, and that pushes us also, pushes us in other directions. It, uh, it pushes us in, in, in our take, taking care of health uh, and refusal sometimes of the health uh, care that's uh, available. 
uh, of, of finances, of, uh, of, of relationships that I try to uh, bully or, uh, or in other ways try to manipulate to, to my own benefit. Um, the problem of the fall from blessed neediness <clears throat> is that needy, we, we, we don't stop being needful, but instead it becomes a wretched neediness because we cannot provide those things. We can do it for a period of time. We can do it for uh, <clears throat> in limited ways. But the result is, and uh, you have seen this all the time, um, people who have uh, denied the real needs that they have and therefore have become uh, hopeless uh, in their wretched, uh, wretched suffering. So, uh, and I would uh, say, you know, the potential here is that human beings who slip in that direction and to, and to go into that, uh, 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 that downward spiral is that uh, need becomes a black hole of, of irresolvable uh, 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 destitution and, uh, and it becomes uh, that problem. From a Christian perspective, from the language of this idea of neediness, we're saying that potential is in all of us and it's something to uh, to, to watch. So that brings us to point E. If that is the problem, uh, if, if needfulness <clears throat> is a blessing, is a, is a good thing, and, and then the fall into neediness uh, is the problem, from that perspective, how can we say, how can we understand what Jesus does for us in his, because what he does is he, he wants to change things. He wants to create a new situation and reality for us. Uh, there's no question that Jesus understood his own human neediness in prayer, uh, in fellowship, uh, in, uh, in provision. He's the one who said, uh, you know, we have 5,000 hungry people here and his disciples said, uh, send them away. And he said, no, no, we're going to feed them. <laughs> we're going to feed them. He understood that. And in his compassion, as we read in, uh, in the, in the, in the passage in Mark, in his compassion, uh, he, uh, he, he broke the bread uh, <clears throat> and shared the fish to the 5,000 people. But it would mean uh, then that, that his work on the cross and, uh, and the resurrection um, isn't something then that um, produces for us or allows us to discover a, a new uh, independence of some kind. Um, we are not saved into independence. We are not saved from needfulness. From this perspective then, what salvation is, uh, is that it's a salvation into our realization of the blessedness of needfulness, where we begin to walk in thanksgiving to God, in openness to others, uh, and in, uh, <clears throat> in, op in readiness to, uh, to share in that, uh, in that broader reality of, uh, of, of what we are created to enjoy. So we're looking at need as a <clears throat> positive element in, uh, in human thriving and health. Need is, uh, needfulness is, uh, uh, is a good thing. Uh, I'm going to say again, nurses know this. Um, you, as nurses, some of the uh, <clears throat> advice that you have and the, and the ministry that you have, uh, some of it is to uh, reduce uh, uh, wretched neediness uh, and, uh, and to, and to, to, to uh, help people toward, toward better behaviors. But those behaviors are to, to become back in connection with family, to be back into connection with proper health and behavior, back into uh, <clears throat> life settings where, uh, where that can be sustained. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking of uh, stories. Uh, okay, here's one. Um, the story of a, of a, a nurse who, um, who was dealing with a situation where a, a, a teenage boy was dying, and, and he was definitely dying. Uh, the doctors had determined that he had not much more time. Uh, and his mother was with him, but because of, uh, there, there was a concern that he not uh, be uh, exposed to any more uh, uh, um, negative things. Uh, she was in a hospital gown and latex gloves. And the nurse that saw that went to the doctors and said, he's dying. 
can't she hold her child with her hands? And they made the decision that she could. So she put on her regular dress and she held uh, her son um, in her hand, skin to skin, and, um, <clears throat> and he passed away. Uh, there's the connection, right? There's the, uh, the need that we acknowledge and we celebrate. Uh, and I think that's the opportunity of looking at uh, human, human persons from this uh, perspective. A human need as a positive element. In human thriving, it's a good thing for needs to be recognized and, uh, and for the provision to be there. So the last thing to say, I think, about this area is if all of that is true to the extent that is true, then yes, we need to be aware of others as being needful and needy. Uh, and in our relationship to them, we cannot divorce that from the fact that we, in that moment, are ourselves uh, needful and needy. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's just a, a perspective to understand how we are relating to others and what it means then to be um, to be relating to persons. My area of uh, primary responsibility in my, as administrator in the School of Theology is my work with the teams that we send out of uh, nursing students to other countries. And we send them to uh, societies that generally are far less uh, fortunate than ours. And so they have an opportunity to connect with the poorest of the poor, whether in the, uh, the favelas, the slums of, uh, of Rio de Janeiro, uh, or in the, in the hospitals of India, uh, or in uh, uh, other countries, Vietnam and so forth. Again and again, what the students say when they return. Uh, what did you learn, we ask, we'd like to know. And uh, often uh, the thing that is, is said is that I learned uh, what it was to be a person. I learned what a person is. Uh, once I got away from the structures of my culture, and I saw someone in, uh, in desperate uh, situations. So, what is a person? Think about it. I'm continuing to think about it. Uh, and here, these are some resources to, uh, to consider what that means. But in conclusion, uh, I would uh, just reiterate these two elements. The human being is an agent. We are an agent of change. We are an agent of the good. Those beings who can accomplish good things, things that last in the, the goodness of the Lord uh, and, uh, and things that have a definite meaning. But we're also humans as recipients. We always are uh, needing to receive for our strength, uh, for our uh, purposes, uh, simply to be alive, simply to rejoice uh, and enjoy what, uh, uh, what, what life is like. All right. So. I'll ask you the question, what is a person?